Good evening, everyone. I am uh, Rudy Elfuri, Dean of the School of Architecture, and I'm happy to welcome you all to our first Techno Glass lecture for the Spring 2019 series. Let me first take uh, the opportunity to thank our sponsor, Techno Glass, who has supported our ambitious programming for four years, and actually this is our fifth series. This one is titled Impact, a reference to firms both small and large, to projects both modest and grand, that have a capacity to impact the field in a meaningful way. I'm also pleased to announce that uh, the AIA is now partnering with us to offer attendees 1.5 CEUs per lecture, so please remember to sign up with Win here if you are interested. Our guest speaker tonight is uh, Michael Maltzen. Michael received a Bachelor of Architecture from the Rhode Island School of Design and a Master of Architecture from the Harvard Graduate School of Design. He founded Michael Maltzen Architecture in 1995 a practice committed to the creation of progressive, transformative experiences that chart new trajectories for architecture, urbanism, and the public realm. The Los Angeles-based practice has developed partnerships across disciplines to integrate sustainability and architectural form, and is especially known for projects that intimately engage context and community. It has been recognized with five progressive architecture awards and 42 citations from the American Institute of Architects. This must be a, a record of sorts. This body of work has been featured in international publications and museums worldwide that are too numerous to list. Let me just mention some of the exhibition venues. Museum of Modern Art, the Canadian Center for Architecture, the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, the Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art, the Vitra Design Museum, and the Carnegie Museum's Heinz Architectural Center with an accompanying monograph entitled Alternate Crown. Michael's projects cross a wide range of typologies from cultural institutions to city infrastructure. His multifamily residential projects completed over the past decade including Star Apartments, New Carver Apartments, Crest Apartments, and One Santa Fe have gained international acclaim for the quality of the architecture and construction, but also for their innovative social vision. These works, which had a significant impact, are the focus of Michael's most recent book, Social Transparency, Projects and Housing, published by the Columbia University Press in 2016. Social Transparency is also the title of his lecture tonight. Please join me in welcoming Michael Molson. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rudolf, for uh, inviting me and uh, for the introduction. Um, when uh, Rudolf asked me to, um, to uh, speak in this lecture series. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, showing primarily, or talking primarily about housing, which is what I'm going to do tonight. Um, as he also mentioned, our practice is uh, fairly wide ranging in terms of the kinds of projects uh, that we're involved in. Uh, but there has become a specific focus for the um, for this studio around housing. And in particular, a particular focus uh, for me personally in terms of housing. Um, I, like uh, many architects who were raised uh, in our generation in an architectural culture, saw housing as one of the fundamental typologies of modern architecture, a project type where architects strove to intertwine housing with the most progressive and optimistic approaches towards space, technology, ideas about living, and politics. 
I bring this up because I personally was deeply affected by that work and I came to believe that architecture was an agent of change and progress and that housing was at the center of that idea, uh, an idea that I still very much uh, believe in. And yet, we also know these images in architecture which fairly or unfairly became icons of architecture's perceived role in the diminishment of the progressive possibilities of housing and largely divorced from the complexities of the surrounding city. And out of that complicated history of modernism, architecture lost its roles, or at the very least people became suspicious of that role, as an agent of ideas and solutions, and perhaps most importantly, about its roles in speculations about the future of the city. Almost simultaneously, the emergence of the single family home in post-war suburbs and cities like Los Angeles largely overrode the conversation about collective and multifamily housing, as well as many of the defining issues of the city itself. Identity, density, community being just a few of those important issues. But in many cities, and especially in Los Angeles, the manifest destiny-like expansion and sprawl to the periphery of those cities has slowed. Density, mobility, affordability, and community are pressing concerns, and housing is again an important model for understanding how we address those priorities. But also, and may, maybe most importantly, to begin to reimagine the city itself. Architecture's role, especially housing's role, in both grappling with these challenges and anticipating the future city are driving forces in our work in the studio. I would argue that housing is nothing less than a microcosm of the city itself. I'm gonna talk about five projects uh, tonight they're all in Los Angeles, uh, but they're all trying to understand the role and especially the range of scales of housing in uh, the idea of the dynamic contemporary city, which hopefully has some uh, relationship uh, to, to Miami as well. I wanna start though uh, with the house, uh, which is in many ways the fundamental uh, housing type underpinning uh, the idea of housing in California, and uh, I've argued in the past, contains many of the questions, uh, ideas, and mechanisms uh, of our lives and culture. This is the Pittman Dow residence. Uh, it's adjacent to, uh, just make sure, uh, right here. It's adjacent to a Richard Neutra house. They're all part of the same uh, site. Uh, there are three pads that were built uh, the Cyrulnik house here was the first built, and then the two other pads were left um, unbuilt for uh, a number of years. Neutra had this idea, whenever he tried to build houses um, in Los Angeles, uh, having some socialist affinities, uh, he was always trying to produce a kind of small commune um, of houses around those, the uh, developments that he was involved in. Uh, and, and often he would be able to build multiple houses on one site. In this case, uh, the two other, two other pads were left. But the new owners, uh, Larry Pittman and Roy Dowell, two painters who bought the uh, Cyrulnik house uh, about 15 years ago, uh, started to believe that uh, uh, potentially another house to live in more permanently uh, was uh, something that they were interested in. Um, for a variety of reasons, uh, uh, in that they would build this new house basically adjacent to the Neutra house, the Neutra house becoming kind of like the upstairs, uh, almost like a library. This is the Cyrulnik house, which was built for Neutra's assistant and her husband uh, in the 1950s. It's a kind of quintessential, it is a quintessential Neutra house, but quintessential modernist house from that period completely um, open to the surrounding uh, context around it, the mountains uh, and the views. In, in a way, it has uh, that romantic idea of modernist uh, transparency. But one of the issues that Larry and Roy started to grapple with was that that sense of, of complete transparency uh, became more and more difficult to live with, uh, both in a physical way, it gets windy, it's very cold there, they have a small dog, there are coyotes and bears, 
um, but also because uh, there was this idea that as two public, um, uh, public intellectuals in many ways, uh, who have very creative lives and um, uh, are very involved in, in the arts community in the city. That that idea of transparency uh, was uh, and connectedness was something that uh, never seemed to have an off switch. Uh, that they, the idea of being constantly transparent to the world uh, around you uh, started to become uh, much uh, more and more difficult. So what uh, they had uh, approached us with was the idea of creating almost a kind of alter ego house. And uh, the new house is um, just down the hill from the existing Cyrulnik uh, house. It, it's a kind of uh, inversion of, of the Cyrulnik house, uh, where the Cyrulnik house is completely about transparency on the exterior. Uh, the new house is, is really uh, primarily uh, opaque uh, on uh, the exterior. The house has a particular plan, it's seven-sided. Uh, that has a lot to do with the way that you move up and around to the house uh, in this clockwise motion. Um, any of the even-sided figures, at first I had this idea that on that site, because you moved around it, uh, that a round shape uh, might be the most compelling form. But what I realized was that uh, as you move around that kind of platonic form, it's incredibly static. Uh, and then, because of that, we started to explore another, a series of other even-sided figures, six and eight-sided figures, but they always seem to refer to uh, a, a kind of classical center in the house. Instead, uh, what I was interested in was a house that uh, uh, maybe inferred an internal life, uh, but never completely uh, allowed you to complete the geometric puzzle in your mind. The seven-sided house seems to constantly spin, uh, never completely resolve as you move around it. Um, the interior of the house is where that inversion between the Neutra house and this house starts to uh, really take place or, or is completed. The inside is uh, almost completely or is, is primarily transparent as if the exterior walls had been folded inside uh, uh, the house uh, and that um, uh, rooms start to be placed uh, uh, absolutely adjacent to each other, separated only by the thinnest uh, glass line with the idea that whether you're in the bedroom looking through the courtyard into the living room or you're in the bathroom looking into the uh, uh, bedroom to the library or the kitchen into uh, both the library here on the left and the courtyard to the right, that uh, that idea of privacy is one that gets completely uh, negotiated um, within the walls of the house, but is still something uh, that, uh, that is, uh, needs to be navigated. Um, and that idea of simultaneity, that we are all in many ways at this point, both physically and virtually, in many places at the same time, uh, I think is one of the great uh, spatial challenges uh, for uh, our generation of architects in the way that uh, the ambition for transparency, the blurring of inside and outside, was one of the great spatial challenges for uh, the modernists. Um, around the same time, uh, we started to work with a group called the Skid Row Housing Trust um, to uh, design, build uh, multifamily uh, housing in, in, in around downtown Los Angeles. This is the second project uh, Carver Apartments that we did for uh, Skid Row about 10 years ago. Uh, Skid Row approached us because they were changing the model of housing that they had been involved in, which was primarily to uh, create transitional housing for homeless individuals and uh, transitional housing being housing that takes people off the street for a brief period of time, trying to give them some uh, threshold, some uh, ramp in which to reestablish connections uh, uh, with service providers, uh, with um, uh, medical, uh, psychological uh, treatment, um, 
uh, to basically get their feet underneath them. The problem tended to be that because of the brevity of the amount of time that they were in those, uh, those basically apartments or hotels, uh, uh, it, the, the challenges that existed back out on the street were things that constantly pulled them back out onto the street. So recidivism was very, very high. They were looking to change the model to something called permanent supportive housing, uh, which is exactly what it says it is. Uh, these are permanent units. If you get one of these units, you can live there ostensibly for the rest of your life. Uh, and uh, supportive in that the supportive services, as opposed to the individual having to go out into the city to try to find those uh, services, those services are brought uh, into the building, both of which have the uh, uh, effect of starting to create uh, real uh, community. This project is particular because the first project and many of the projects that Skid Row was doing was were on Skid Row itself, which is more in the center of downtown. Uh, but one of the goals that the trust had was to move these buildings uh, into uh, into more dynamic conversations with the rest of the city to make them more visible, to not allow that community that lived in these buildings uh, to be written off um, or to become anonymous in the city. This is uh, right at the 10 freeway, which connects um, the ocean Santa Monica, uh, more or less actually with you um, eventually um, here. And the building is uh, right next to uh, the highway about uh, 25 feet away. Not dissimilarly, at least at the ground level, uh, the house shares some uh, similar geometric ambitions as the Pittman Dowell House, which I just showed you. Uh, this building is on a very irregular site, basically a kind of pie-shaped uh, site with the highway on this edge, uh, alley on the back, and a street, cul-de-sac, dead ends, um, ironically Hope Street, um, uh, at the at the building. Uh, within the building, at the ground level, there are a number of, of those different parts of the program outside of uh, housing. There's community kitchen, community garden, uh, there's meeting rooms, there are service provider offices. But what's uh, really uh, uh, in effect here is this sense that at that ground level, uh, that you can either get visually um, views through, kind of visual skewers through the building connecting across the site, or at least uh, if you live there, physically be able to move across that ground level as if it's a kind of mini campus with, uh, within the city. As you move, um, this is an uh, image of the building as it's being built. On the ground level, all concrete, uh, in a, very similar to the kind of underneath of the infrastructure that's adjacent to it. And this was one of the uh, qualities of the site that the trust was very interested in this uh, type of space that often um, the individuals who are eventually gonna be living in the building end up in under the highway. Uh, and that connection between those, those two spaces was very much on everybody's mind. As you move up through the building, uh, past the first floor, the form starts to change and it becomes more circular, um, but is also a real response to the proximity of the, of the highway. Probably one of the biggest challenges we had in this project was uh, the acoustics because of its proximity to the 10 freeway. And one of the things we uh, began to find out was, was that um, every foot away from a sound generation source that you can get sees a commensurate drop in the decibel uh, level, especially inside these units. And um, by, by basically curving the facade away, it had the technical benefit of starting to allow us to make quieter units and also to reduce the cost of the exterior skin because cost in these types of projects are such a determining factor in terms of uh, what you can uh, provide for the individuals who live here. Um, it also uh, starts to create, from an architectural standpoint, a kind of kinetic relationship with the movement, I won't do this to you too many times, but um, uh, kinetic, kinetic relationship uh, with you as you move by 
uh, the building on the highway is if the building is in a kind of dance um, or a, a type of animation with the movement of, um, uh, uh, of the cars as, as uh, they go by on the highway. As you move up through the building, as I mentioned, the plan really does change. Each of the units uh, is a self-contained studio apartment, each of them exactly the same, although the building starts to spiral and open, uh, creating uh, views from the center courtyard out to a portion of the city beyond. Um, and it also has the effect, this kind of serrated uh, form was less expensive to build, but starts to create a bit more of a, a individual identity to the units, uh, to the individuals within the units, and even in minor ways, starts to create very small thresholds at the front door between the courtyard, which is quite tight uh, on the inside of the building and, um, and your apartment. Like much of the housing <clears throat> in uh, Los Angeles, whether it's market rate housing or uh, not-for-profit housing, uh, the ubiquitous building material that we have to work with often is wood coming out of the long trajectory of the single-family house construction type. Uh, and this building was no different. It's concrete on the ground floor and then five floors of wood with this um, center core of steel uh, that performs many, many functions, uh, deals with the seismic issues within the building, but also starts to deal with um, methane venting because there is methane on the site and takes all of the rainwater from the roof eventually down through. So it's a kind of multifunctional um, interior uh, cage, uh, which when clad creates this uh, community space on the inside of the building uh, that no matter, uh, um, how you move through the building, every time you come in or out of your apartment, you start to become a part of this semi-public community uh, space. And that, that move to, uh, with each of these fins, make them performative uh, by taking the rainwater out or protecting the building from an earthquake uh, structurally or venting the building from methane so it doesn't blow up um, is absolutely essential to trying to draw as much economy, as much architecture uh, out of each of those elements. In a sense, we have this rule when we do these projects that we don't always, aren't always able to adhere to, but all elements need to try to do three things. There's this kind of tripleness to uh, what we're trying to achieve with the different architectural elements. While the majority of the social spaces are on that ground level into the courtyard, there's some other important spaces, including uh, the uh, TV room and laundry room on the third floor, uh, which is at the level of the highway, and then this outdoor space on the roof, so that you, as the building spirals, you're also able to uh, start to move uh, up with better and better views of the highway. That laundry room and TV room is one of the most important social spaces in the building. And as prosaic as uh, those functions are, um, putting it on the same level as the elevated highway um, was important because it's one of those places where as people are in the building going about their normal life and as people are uh, either driving by or more often than not stopped dead in traffic outside of the building, there's this uh, just momentary opportunity for those two communities that are almost always anonymous from each other to see each other. And this is one of the places where the kind of strategy of architecture and the placement of different spaces, especially even more than form, uh, I think can have an enormous uh, effect uh, on that kind of social and community um, uh, strategy. This is looking up into that, that courtyard space. It's open on the top. Uh, it has the quality of becoming a kind of picture window to the sky. The, as the light of the sky changes over the course of the day, so does the color on these metal fins inside the um, space so that um, it seems to be constantly shifting uh, uh, from a color and uh, light standpoint just as much as there is a great deal of movement within the building. The third uh, project that we completed with uh, the housing trust. It's called Star Apartments. It's 102 units. The previous project 
uh, was 98 units, Carver Apartments. 102 units, again, for the same uh, community, uh, formerly homeless, uh, permanent supportive uh, housing project. Uh, and this project is back on Skid Row. Um, it is uh, very much on the edge of the city. This is the kind of Skid Row uh, neighborhood, and this is the city that most people know, and certainly uh, the skyline uh, that is even denser now since uh, this picture was taken. Um, the skyline that many people know, but uh, I think um, what's what's really uh, extraordinary about seeing it in this way is just how proximate um, what is one of the epicenters of of the homeless issue, homeless problem in Los Angeles is to uh, to that downtown cultural and uh, civic civic core. Um, Star Apartments is probably the most ambitious architecturally of the projects that we were, we've been involved with uh, the trust on. Taking on issues, uh, or trying to take on issues around density, adaptive reuse, which I'll talk a little bit about, and new construction techniques. Density was one of the first pieces of, of that equation. Density is not something which Los Angeles is normally known for. It's certainly not part of its identity or reputation. But increasingly, it's becoming one of the most challenging aspects of the city as it, as it continues to evolve. And I think one of the goals with housing is to try to find new models of densifying the city uh, without necessarily importing models from other more traditional uh, cities to try to invent that density more or less on our own terms. And this uh, project has a kind of, at least for Los Angeles, a kind of hyperdensity with units not only around the perimeter, which is more traditional, but also units on the inside uh, of the building as well as uh, a number of amenities on the inside core of the building. From an adaptive reuse standpoint, uh, one of the goals of the trust was to not just build housing, but to be more participate to participate more in the life of the everyday life of the city. And for a long time, they had wanted to do at the very least ground floor retail, which is not uh, a huge. It's not. It wouldn't seem like an extraordinary thing, but uh, given the way that the money. Um, often comes the subsidies for rent subsidies, subsidies from housing government uh, housing departments come to these projects. You're not allowed to be in the retail business. Uh, the trust found a loophole, and that loophole said that if you have an existing building that has retail in it, you could keep that retail going. So they went out and bought this building, which they then asked us to make it the base of the building. Um, uh, which we did, for the most part, the concrete frame on the inside was reusable. There had been parking on the top, which we were able to tuck um, into the back of the building. The facade, the stucco facade was largely, at least in my mind, sacrificial, and so we scraped uh, uh, that off. Um, but that building became quite literally the base of, of our building, allowing the ground floor to be uh, retail and participate more um, in the uh, in this part of, of the city. But there was a pragmatic challenge to that, which was how do you start to build a, a, a building on a site that already has a building on it and there's no place to really stage uh, significant construction or to disrupt this dense uh, part of the city um, uh, or very active part of the city uh, uh, for any, any long period of time. Uh, we, we started to look at potentially building the project using more prefab or modular uh, units, which is something we had looked at in the past. It wasn't so possible, but in this project started to become more and more possible. Uh, it means that uh, we constructed this concrete tray, which then needles down in very surgical ways through the existing building to allow for that existing building to remain intact. And then the units came in and were stacked on top of um, that concrete tray, which you can begin to get a sense of both in this diagram, but also you can see the units being uh, lifted off of the, the truck here, being put in place um, uh, uh, on the building. They, the units, because uh, there's another piece of it, which I won't go into, but multifamily prefabricated uh, units were not allowed in Los Angeles until this project, and so there was a we had to negotiate uh, 
to make this a pilot program in the city. Um, but the upshot of that was that there were no manufacturers anywhere near Los Angeles who could do these projects. So the units were built in Boise, Idaho, and then trucked to the site. Um, once they got to the site, all the units got to the site, all 104 units were put in place in, in uh, just a little over three weeks. Um, so that there was uh, a very rapid construction um, period. Each of the units is exactly the same. These are these uh, miniature models that we made. The project was in the Venice Biennale this past summer. Um, but one of the things we produced were these dioramas. These are only uh, a few of them. Twelve of them, of all of the units, uh, absolutely faithful reproductions of the um, individual's units um, down to uh, each of the maquettes, each of these dioramas are about this large, so they're, they're quite miniature. And, and everything, you know, the pictures that they, the pictures that they have um, hanging in the space and uh, the guitar collection and the vacuum cleaner uh, as a way of trying to chart um, the different personalities that these very similar units have uh, given um, the life of, of those individuals. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, um, because of the construction on that tray, uh, the units up above, the existing building down below, starts to create this in-between space uh, that takes the place of those courtyard spaces I showed, or the courtyard space I showed in uh, Carver Apartments and has been a theme in many of our housing projects, this kind of center community courtyard that's open to the sky. Here, it's more uh, almost a reinterpretation of, of the Los Angeles um, horizontal space, continuous space. The semi-public outdoor um, social space is squished uh, into this in-between layer that takes on many, many different functions that include things like community kitchen, uh, community garden, uh, there's art classrooms, social spaces, some of those service provider spaces, uh, vocational training, there's a half court basketball court, uh, jogging track that runs around, jogging walking track that walks around or uh, loops around the entire building, as if it's, uh, again, a kind of condensation, a densification of many of those different types of, of uh, social and public functions in the building or in the city, written into the building. This is before the tennis court uh, went in, just to give you a scale of some of those spaces. The building is quite raw. In that sense, it's not so different than the infrastructure that stands or sits around it. Um, but the scale and the ambition of, of the scale of the building is to start to provide within the building um, spaces that are uh, uh, subsumed within the, the, the life of, of this building that are really at the scale uh, of the city that start to move from that smaller, more intimate domestic scale, residential scale, to something that uh, uh, approximates the scale immediately outside uh, of, of the building. Um, the most recently completed, we're in process of working on another, in design on another project for the trust, uh, but the most recently completed project that we did was also a project that moved outside of uh, the city called Crest Apartments um, and is located in Van Nuys, which is in the valley, if anybody knows Los Angeles, the San Fernando Valley, uh, which is across the hills from the larger Los Angeles basin, just as much a kind of sprawl uh, uh, context, um, the San Gabriel Mountains beyond, uh, uh, Sherman Way, which is a major strip street, uh, that runs more or less kind of east to west. Um, and then uh, one of the uh, channelized tributaries to the Los Angeles River. And for the most part, this um, single family sprawl. Uh, and then on the other side, uh, an more or less an industrial or light industrial shipping um, uh, park. Our building is right on the strip in this longer uh, site. Uh, and in, a, in many ways spans between uh, this kind of landscape and the speed uh, and intensity of that strip and this smaller uh, residential district behind. In this part of the city, there is a, 
fairly common type of uh, residential building that was built in the post-war, but really in the 50s, 60s, into the 70s that have become, they're, they're called dingbat apartments. The um, uh, name was coined in the, in the 60s. Um, but what they generally are is uh, a, a building that fills the entire deep site, has a very small facade, thin facade to the street, and are generally uh, always parking on the ground level. They fill the site, and the parking is pretty much takes over the entire ground level. Uh, and then they uh, sit up uh, over the, if this is the ground and um, the parking is underneath, then they sit above that one, two, sometimes three stories, but generally one to two stories. One of the problems that's been discovered over the years is because they have this soft story um, in an earthquake, they tend to um, fly off the foundations. Um, but that, that type of, of building uh, deals in very uh, logical ways, in very realistic ways, uh, with the development needs, which has been about the car uh, taking over that ground level uh, and then maximizing, maximizing the site. Um, this is one of them here, although this is a larger one. Uh, there's a manager's unit in front and all the parking is, is immediately behind this. Uh, the site that they, the trust found had been empty for a long time and was almost a, it me, a kind of feral site. Um, planting had grown up all around it, um, very empty. Um, but this part of the city is at the leading edge of that type of density we talked about, uh, or I talked about before. Um, and in, in some ways, this project is both trying to uh, reimagine that uh, dingbat typology um, and see what qualities could be brought back uh, to it spatially, mostly by starting to reimagine, given the, uh, the um, diminishing need for cars, especially with this community, to reimagine that ground plane as something that was more vital and uh, uh, more connected to the community as a whole. Uh, and then, uh, secondly, to start to uh, think about how a vertical start to play out in this kind of landscape. The building uh, almost quite literally seems to float on columns, on piloti above uh, that ground plane. The ground plane, this is, some of these photographs are quite early, but uh, uh, from a landscape standpoint, the ambition was to uh, recreate that wildness or informality of the uh, feral landscape, but using uh, natural, uh, natural plants or, or uh, native plants, excuse me. Um, the building uh, steps down in the front and to the back and also has a kind of crescent in plan, uh, which allows for a very pragmatic need, which is the fire trucks to come in and turn around and come back. So the shaping of the building was, was uh, partially determined by this one very particular um, uh, legal need. From the other side, you can see how the building starts to float up above. There is some parking that we've provided underneath, uh, primarily for the service providers who come work uh, at the building. But very quickly, that landscape uh, beyond the building starts to uh, uh, become much more naturalized. And another piece of, of the ambition was in a uh, increasingly drought um, uh, problematized um, region, uh, starting to capture water on the site and not let it run off, but let it percolate back into, into the site uh, is a real ambition. So almost everything that's not un literally under the building itself is pervious landscape allowing the building to be uh, uh, or participate in, in some replenishment of, of the aquifer. This gives you a sense of, of the plan of the landscape. The building does touch down on this side. These are some service provider offices, community kitchen. There's outdoor uh, uh, eating area. This is community garden on this side, and all of this is landscape. And what starts to happen is that that, that arc of the building, even though it started uh, from a planning standpoint, primarily because of the turning radius of the fire truck, started to create a building that uh, opens up 
uh, to the corners uh, with landscape, and the building uh, very purposely becomes a little bit more ambiguous whether it's a building that is, uh, is uh, defining the edges of the site in a more traditional urbanistic way, or is it a building that is more floating in uh, the garden, which is uh, more part of the identity of, of Los Angeles. As it's grown in, um, that landscape has really started to take over. Most of the parking spaces, because they're not used but required, we also had planted with this turf block. That's the last indicator that there's a parking space there, and maybe eventually that'll, that'll grow over as well. Here you can see it um, from uh, up above, uh, and the scale change from the very, um, I keep wanting to draw on that scheme, from the uh, significant vertical scale, the dingbat apartment on this side, the single family houses behind, and the way along this edge the building um, changes its scale from quite low, gets taller at the center, and then um, uh, down again uh, towards the back, which is a kind of reverse of the, your normal expectation of, of density um, on a site. Um, most of our projects for the trust have been single loaded corridors uh, around a courtyard. So there's a courtyard, the units sit basically around that, there's a walkway on the inside. Um, and the goal there is to uh, turn that experience into a, uh, uh, the reestablishment of a kind of social connection for the individuals who live in these units, very often on the street, created uh, quite separate, internalized lives. But every time you come in or out of that courtyard, you become a part of that community. On this site, we didn't have that possibility. To get the number of units we needed, it had to be a double-loaded corridor, um, which we made much wider than normal uh, so that uh, these spaces, every time the building uh, shifts along that crescent shape, so at these shift points, they widen out, often have open views to the outside. The corridor is completely unconditioned and open to the air. Um, providing a series of these, these uh, almost in-between um, semi-social spaces that are a part of uh, or an extension of that larger social space on, on the ground floor. There are two different unit types, uh, both the same size, but in this case, two different unit types. Fair, uh, very simple, clean, uh, light-filled. Because of the stepping of the building, we are able to get um, uh, two windows in each of the units on two walls, which doesn't seem like a big thing, but it has an enormous effect on the, the ventilation and the quality of light in those, those spaces. Uh, these are some of those views from the outside the corridor. Uh, one of the things that is, has become thematically consistent in a lot of our buildings um, is this use of color as a kind of material. Um, the major material of the buildings are stucco plaster, um, but color has become um, uh, an important part of uh, the sensibility of the building. And um, in many cases, color is painted one part of the building and then over the course of the day starts to reflect on the other surfaces, uh, creating a, almost a fugitive cast of color um, that, that uh, is, is quite dynamic and, and variable over the course of the day. The, the goal being um, for those spaces and your connection to that color and the material and its reflection um, and its variability to not be that different from the way that we often talk about or think about the qualities of, of, uh, of more traditional materials. The last project I, I want to touch on tonight um, it's a project called One Santa Fe. It's the largest project, largest of all the housing projects we've done, completed a, a few years ago. Um, uh, if, if a number of the other projects uh, are distributed around the city uh, and are smaller in scale, one of, one of the goals there has always been to almost think about how um, in a city you can have a series of smaller projects that have some relationship to each other and maybe create a new map or they create a scale of influence by their commonality um, and their relationship to each other, even if they're quite small. It's a way of thinking about large impact of projects or, or thinking about smaller projects as a larger project in the city. 
one Santa Fe is is completely the opposite. It's it 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 ha its quality is in many ways that it has a kind of giant scale, um, uh, a giant scale that's being tested in in a in a in a quite uh, large metropolis. You see the building out here, SciArc, uh, Southern California Institute of Architecture, the school here, former railroad depot, um, is right next to the building. It used to be the longest building in the city. Uh, the LA River is immediately adjacent to the building. And then um, downtown, Skid Row is over here. And then Boyle Heights is just across the river. And Boyle Heights is now uh, really the, the center uh, politically in many ways, uh, as well as culturally, of the uh, Latino community, which is the majority community. Um, in uh, ethnicity in, in Los Angeles. And so this building sits as a kind of threshold along those edges, cultural edges of the city, but also the river and uh, the train tracks um, that run along, uh, along the river. Um, the building's about a little over a quarter of a mile long. It's uh, 440 units, has 80,000 square feet of commercial space um, on, uh, on six levels. Uh, there are moments where the building is, especially as you get close to it, um, uh, really apparent. Um, it, it, has, it, it plays a very strong role in the city. But there are other moments, purposefully, uh, where the, the, the grain and scale of the building starts to uh, maybe approximate some of the smaller scale and formal grains uh, and textures of the city in front and back of it. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that the building, um, in that sense, is equivalent to its context, uh, but it does try to start to replicate or relate to some of the characteristics of this part of the city. Um, the, uh, <laughs> uh, this question of scale, um, I think, is an important one. Uh, in cities because uh, it's one of the places where I, I believe architecture has both the ability and maybe even responsibility to start to talk about its role as urban design. Um, very often those two ideas, urban design and architecture, in terms of their disciplinary specificity are thought of as separate things. That urban design is one thing and architecture is another. Um, and that difference is very often because buildings are one scale and urban design is thought of as a completely different scale. I think it's, it's imperative on architecture in these kinds of cities to try to find ways of making architecture uh, work at a scale where it starts to blur that distinction between urban design and building uh, and starts to um, uh, take um, uh, or work with or invent uh, or address some of the characteristics and mechanisms uh, that urban design often, often starts to work with. In that way, you're able to actually build ideas about urban design through the architecture at the speed of architecture as opposed to the speed of planning. Not dissimilarly to uh, Star Apartments, which is a, uh, a new building palimpsested, placed or layered on uh, an existing building. One Santa Fe doesn't do that exactly, but there are moments visually where you start to see uh, the ambition to almost imagine this is a kind of layered urbanism, not vertical, but horizontal, creating that density on top of different scales and layerings uh, of, of the city around it. This is actually SciArc, um, uh, just in, immediately adjacent to it. Uh, programmatically, the building works very much that way. There's a ground floor uh, commercial across the entire site. Um, on this part of the site, there's parking underground, but on the thin portion of the site, there's a building behind it uh, that's a railway maintenance building. We couldn't dig down, so parking happens on two levels uh, above, basically on the second and third level above the um, retail space. And then, depending on whether you're above parking or in this, is either three or five levels of residential above it all, a kind of um, urban Neapolitan sandwich. It doesn't matter what scale it seems like we work at. Uh, the building technique uh, 
tends to be very, or technology tends to be very similar because the business models for these projects are completely based on this idea of wood frame construction. Uh, and uh, the contractors and the trades that work um, or have worked um, from the post-war period in that material. So even if a building is a quarter of a mile long, uh, it's very often built in the same way with the exception of, in this case, the parking garage and, and that ground floor of, of retail. What's interesting here is that it's the first building I've ever been involved in because of its length, where we didn't build from bottom to top, but built from right to left, basically south to north. And the building is at such a scale that uh, people were uh, moving in to the building on that south side before the north side was, was even finished. It was a kind of assembly line, um, but on, on site. Uh, even though the building has this, this extremely significant scale uh, along that entire length, it's punctuated by a series of often pragmatic moments that are trying to be heightened uh, to more significant urban markers. Um, at the end of 2nd Street, uh, which dead ends into the building, one of the, the ramps for the parking becomes this kind of circular um, form that you see down at the end. There's a large uh, opening, which you'll see again in a minute, that takes you more into the, the heart of, of some of the uh, community spaces within uh, the building. This large bridge allows for that connection through, which eventually will connect all the way through to a train station on the other side and will connect SciArc and the Arts District with that side. Um, that continues all the way down uh, the building. There are a series of these, these um, uh, kind of particular um, uh, uh, informal moments. Um, this is from that other side, SciArc on the other side. You can almost see how the bridge starts to relate to the scale of SciArc across the street. Um, there's an interior muse uh, courtyard space that runs all the way through. This is also early, just after it was constructed. These are all now shops are filled, uh, quite a bit of life in this space. And this parking, convenience parking, is designed in such a way that as um, e either as the cars start to pull away or for special events, they're able to be moved out of the way, and this becomes this kind of big plaza, eventually again connecting the train tracks, the, the metro on this side uh, with the city um, adjacent to it. It's just one of the images more recently of the kind of life inside that building. We're always dealing with this question of affordability. Uh, in the case of some of the first projects I showed, uh, Crest Apartments, Star Apartments, the affordability is really enforced by the, by the uh, particular uh, uh, residence, nonprofit nature of those projects. Uh, one Santa Fe is 80% market rate, 20% affordable, um, which does something for that affordability. But that 20%, um, those apartments went on, uh, went up for lease the first day. Uh, and there was a line for those apartments that was uh, four or five blocks long. They had thousands and thousands of, of applicants um, uh, for those apartments. That need uh, is significant. One of the ways that we tried to address it with the developer in this project was in the variety of different types of units in the building uh, that we could provide at that scale, allowing there to be different ways of living in the building uh, beyond the kind of common one bedroom and, and two bedroom units which make up the majority of, of uh, market rate apartments. So there's everything from uh, live work units, these little micro studios, um, junior one bedrooms, to um, four bedroom units which are meant to be able to house eight uh, people living um, in that space in a kind of co-living uh, situation. And that kind of scale differentiation to the unit type um, is, is, I think, just as important as the metrics of how much affordability you have in any particular project. Finally, um, when One Santa Fe was built, uh, we were, um, project was, was, there were a lot of positive, um, there was a lot of positive feedback 
uh, about the building, but we, the building was criticized, and the uh, primary criticism was that the building was out of scale, um, and that it was too big for the city. And, um, and I, I understand that, that criticism, and I think uh, if you believe that the city, or a city like Los Angeles, and maybe even Miami, uh, is going to remain, or the scale of the city is going to remain exactly as it is today, then that criticism, I think, is a very valid one. Uh, but in these cities, very dynamic contemporary cities that are changing radically and quickly uh, uh, over time, and also given the length of not only the time it takes to build architecture, but how long architecture exists in the city, that uh, I believe that one of our responsibilities is not so much to try to meet the scale of the city as it is today, but to begin to speculate uh, on what the scale of the city will be like tomorrow, what the scale of the city will be like in 20, 25, 50 years, so that the buildings that we make are still able to participate in a realistic way as that city continues to transform. That's a place that I think architecture has, a, and architects have a particularly profound role, uh, important role in the conversations, not only about the buildings we make, but the cities that we make those buildings in, to understand uh, what the factors are that are in play that form and pressurize uh, the city, to begin to speculate uh, and um, uh, uh, think about uh, how that city is going to continue to evolve, to uh, begin to um, speculate about forms and spaces uh, that meet the city at that point, and to begin to represent it in a way, not only through the buildings, but through all of the other means that we have at our disposal to make sure that uh, architecture and those ideas are consistently at the fore, uh, at the front, uh, at the leading edge of the conversation around uh, urbanism and cities in the future. Thank you. So this is when we shift to a more conversational part of the evening. And we usually, a couple of us, faculty, uh, initiate the conversation with you and then we open it to the okay. audience. Sounds good. Sounds good. I'm getting I'm inviting. Rocco is going to lead the conversation. I think one of the things that comes out of the work, and I think I, we've talked about this a bit, is the um, one of the most important questions for housing in general, and, and maybe LA is a perfect example for a place to look at this question, but is the relationship between the, the individual versus the collective. That um, obviously social housing is, is um, um, has that built into it. The question of 
less easy way. Um, but they have to exist simultaneously as a part of uh, as a part of the city, as a part of a kind of healthy, vibrant, um, uh, progressive city. And you know, in a city like Los Angeles, um, for many years, certainly post-war, which is when a lot of the city changed significantly, and that that that. Uh, extraordinary sprawl of the city, based primarily on the single family house. Um, that's when that really took off and that uh, became so much of, of the physical quality of the city. And, and the, the challenge at that point, not only with the house, but mobility, primarily around the car, uh, uh, meant that people were pulled apart. Community uh, was, was really particular particularized, um, uh, was dispersed, and individuals living in more suburban situations were able to live quite separately from the idea of a community. And the things that, that bound community together were really more um, labels and definitions than they were physical or spatial um, form and activity. Um, but again, as, as density has made that challenging um, in cities, but also uh, resource issues and sustainability and mobility and economics have changed uh, in cities. Um, it's, uh, I think, generationally have changed as well. There's, there's a greater focus on um, how, uh, well, the reality of, of individuals living more collectively that in, in buildings and in, and in spaces. Um, I think that's, for me, that's one of the things that is so interesting about working in a place like Los Angeles. And I, I mentioned our ambition to not import models from other cities, uh, but to look at the city and try to evolve it with this question in mind. Because for instance, one of the things, one of the underlying characteristics of living in Los Angeles that isn't going to go away anytime soon is that people have this idea that they're going to live in a single family house and they have a backyard and they have a private house. They have some connection to the outside and they have out outdoor space. Even when you start to create more collective living, denser living, that expectation, that ambition, that identity for the city isn't changing. So how can you start to write that, the ambition of the individual into I think that's where, in, from an arch architectural standpoint, I think that's where invention lies, is putting them together and understanding that um, it's not an easy, uh, it's not easy to repair that relationship that was ripped a long time ago apart, but the tension of putting them back together again uh, is a place where there's an enormous amount of architectural um, possibility. Oh, and it's like you Ones. Do you think then that tension is reflected formally in, in the work, in the way that there is an attempt to articulate the individuality of the unit in, in, in relationship to the whole? Uh, like for instance, that may explain the, the, the jagged That's exactly exactly right. It's been a that that's been something that in each successive project, um, uh, I have continued to, in many ways, uh, struggle with the the answer in my mind to that. In the beginning, um, I was more interested in the individual being more visible on the exterior of the building. Primarily by formally breaking the building down into a series of unit size, unit size forms. Um, but I got concerned with that when we did Star Apartments, the, the prefab, uh, the modular project. And, and for two reasons. One, um, I was concerned that 
modules went in that if we, we could have put the skin on the factory. I don't know if you noticed in that image, they had just had the building waterproofing on so that the plaster went on after it on site. That was very conscious. We could have put the exterior cladding on in the factory. Um, but I was concerned that if we did that, that the units would look like mobile homes or uh, like containers. And I thought that was saying something about that particular community and that was, was wrong. I was very cautious about that. But secondly, uh, I thought that um, unifying the, all of those individuals with a more common um, material, a more common facade, spoke more to ultimately the ambitions for community than um, specifically the I don't think I have a, um, I, don't, I, th I don't think I can say I, I believe one, I don't, I don't think I have an answer to which is more correct. But the tension that I'm referring to is probably more the tension each time of trying to figure out what that right balance uh, is. And correct me if I'm wrong, it seems that that tension that you, you, you build in the project is always something that unfolds or is discovered dynamically. So it was big, very much invested in that kind of physical relation between the unit and the, the whole, but it is not something that changes as you move around the building and your expectations are uh, uh, contradicted by a discover more picturesque discovery of the human life. It, that, that's absolutely right. Now that, that has some relationship to uh, my other work as well. Um, but even more specifically in, in this work, um, I think you can, uh, I think you can communicate your ambitions to talk about the individual and the community, the collective, however you want to describe it, through the form of the building. Um, but maybe the most powerful way of creating that connection is through experience. And that dynamic of both people within the building, residents within the building, as well as people moving around in the city, connecting to the building, uh, starts to create a connection through that, that, that shared experience. You mean like the buildings are exemplary in terms of what they achieve uh, with, this, uh, with uh, density, adaptive reuse, sustainability, social and uh, material, uh, but what I found remarkable is that is the set of what I would, would call formal or aesthetic preoccupations, which are carried over from uh, like the institutional buildings into the housing projects. The assumption is that when you're dealing with housing, those uh, considerations, the aesthetic project, let's put it this way, is muted in favor of more pressing issues. But it seems like you are unwilling to yeah, no, relinquish. Yes. No, completely, yes, completely. Uh, that we've been uh, consistently <laughs> criticized uh, from the beginning, a little less so now, but certainly very much in the beginning half of, of that work. We were heavily criticized for making, why are you making the buildings look so, like something, look so good for that community? And for me, it really gets back to this also the individual and the collective one, it's clear that the sense of connection and ownership and, um, and pride that the people who live in the buildings have because something was made with real intention for them, that shows up in all of the evaluations of the people who live there after they come back and they, just, um, uh, they survey the individuals and they do assessments of them. Um, but also, I think as an architect, or as anybody in living in this city, how can you say that anything in this city that we make should be less than others? You know, you, at that point, you're saying something about, about your own context, your own city, that 
fallible. Speaking of the responsibility of the architect, one of the things I noticed in, in the projects, um, particularly in the Carver, well, in a number of the social housing projects where the ADA is asked, the 25% of the plan, that you were sort of masterfully able to accommodate it and make it not something that's a liability or something that has to be you know, just accommodated, but something that becomes part of the design and something that actually adds to the plan. That, and also I would say the window, I mean, you, you started talking a little bit about it with Car the, the, the public spaces and the Carver project where the, um, let's say the laundry space is visible from the highway, the highway looks in, the people from the building look out, that the windows are given the same kind of individual attention, you know, that even though it may be one type, they're never treated, even in the, the Santa Fe, one Santa Fe, they're never treated as a repetitive pattern but always given some sense that you're looking into something and somebody else is looking out and looking into the world. I, it, well, well, I do think that there's a lot of a sense of the identity uh, of the building through, uh, through, through the windows. Um, and the attention to that back and forth with relationship. Uh, the, uh, I can't believe you would come up with the ADA back and forth. Because if there is one uh, thing that I am going to continue to, to, fight. to fight, to work out, is how to deal with this. Because literally, from the time we started our very first project to, the, to with now, the ADA bathrooms, for very understandable reasons, have continued to grow. But the challenge is that the um, unit sizes, because of the economics of the building, the unit sizes can't change at all. So it's this thing that continues to grow on the inside of the unit to the point where it really is, in many cases now, as big or if not the biggest space in the entire unit. And um, in this latest project we're doing, we, we started with the ADA bathroom. Literally that's the first thing we started to work on. Is I'm, I'm going to crack this puzzle. Not to try to find a way to do away with it or make it smaller, but, but to uh, make that space um, uh, more generous and more a part of the day in, day out life of, of the unit. So we've tried things that are like these, they transform or they open up and they um, become more of an object, a series of objects. I don't have it yet, um, but that, housing is a big deal, but figuring out so that's the lifelong goal. I'm going to get that. Well, and, and then I guess the, the, the question about the housing, um, because LA is so much of a car culture and now thinking about housing uh, in, in a certain density, has that had a, has the infrastructure changed with any of the projects? I mean, has public transportation become something that's followed suit or is that really something that's completely uh, it is changed. separate? And I, I would say that it's changing um, generationally more than it's changing socially or economically. It, it, as a younger, progressively younger generations move into um, or back to the city or from the sur suburbs more towards the core parts of the city, <coughs> you've seen an expect a much lower expectation of asking them for a car. Higher rate clients on different types of transportation. Uh, uh, public transportation has grown significantly in the city, continues to grow significantly. But other methods, the ride sharing apps have changed that uh, great deal. I'd say the youngest 25% of our staff in the office and many people um, still drive, but many people don't or look for alternatives to drive. In the area around one Santa Fe, one of the reasons that area has taken off is that there are a number of businesses uh, that have grown in that area and, and a number of people are moving there, not just because it's a cool place or a great place to live, but because they can set up a life that doesn't depend, they can set up their kind of full life that doesn't depend on an ownership of a car. Um, you can see so many different pressures 
far, I don't think it's gone away as quickly as some people um, uh, would like to believe. But it is already, we are already starting to see maybe a reduction in that. And the place where we're having a lot of those conversations now with developers is what do you do with all of that space? Even if you saw a 30% reduction in the amount of parking in a very large project, what do you do with all of that constructed parking? And one of the things we've been starting to think about, we're not the only ones, is that it may be, there may be this very difficult transitional moment where parking has to come out of the ground and still be parking, which is antithetical to most of what people have started to do, which is to push the parking because it's ugly below ground and make habitable space above it. But inevitably, that space is going to need to be repurposed. That space is going to need to um, have a different relationship to, to program down the line. And if you start to look at ways of moving it up into the building, you have a better chance of starting, of, of imagining a wider range of programs that it can be evolved into, adapting to uh, down the line. But that's a tough conversation at lots of different levels, uh, even just with the city who cities tend to be less likely or less willing to give up their, a lot of their zoning, zoning land use. But that is happening, that transition is happening. Marcus, since we, we are in the context where the school of architecture, I'm always compelled to ask a question that relates to pedagogy. So here it is. It actually, it relates to the hidden theme in the panel of the, the three of us are classmates at the same time. So now I'm receiving uh, communications uh, from Rizzi and a group of people who are mounting, who are gearing up to mount it in a symposium and exhibition that actually frames that moment at Rizzi when we were there as a thing, you know, as a, as a kind of a cultural phenomenon, as a particular pedagogy. So it's going to be an exhibition, talks, etc. I would like to hear your comments about that, but also to maybe say something about how that moment may have shaped your thinking and work. Uh, well, um, I, I'm uh, aware of the symposium and of the work, and you know, it, um, I, I'm really curious to see what kind of form that eventually takes, but. But I think it's an indication uh, that there was, that that was a, a very dynamic moment at that school. Uh, not only in terms of faculty, the ideas, um, but also very much the conversation that was taking place um, amongst uh, the students, a very ambitious group of students um, who were all there at the same time. And also at a moment that were happening in and around architecture at that time, that uh, those fights that we would have really mattered, um, that they were conversations about uh, the future of architecture, um, what role architects would play, and what roles we might play once we left school. And uh, when I, after I left RISD and I went into graduate school, left and worked for a while, um, I tried on many different, uh, many different hats, partially because I was working for people that uh, my responsibility, my role was to uh, make their ideas and make their aesthetic and make their ambitions um, uh, more vivid, more complete. Um, and there's an enormous amount of learning that takes place in doing that. But when I started my practice, um, one of the things I started to uh, discover in the first couple of years was as I started to take off all of those accumulated hats and gloves and coats and 
I still believe in, and that I still believe in here, and that I think still drives a lot of the work that I'm doing, uh, were the ideas that started to form, the interests that started to form, the predilections, the, um, uh, the observations that I could make, were uh, all forming when we were together at Wisdom. Um, and that that's an important thing to realize that on one hand not to pressurize yourself as a student to think that you have to invent your entire future at this moment but to also realize that uh, that the context that you're in and that your colleagues uh, and that the uh, range of ideas that you're immersed in uh, will likely form the armature I could add to that. Since now's our time to talk about what Michael was really like. Um, but but um, um, I remember your interest in Sarah, Richard Sarah's work, and it's very clear to me when you look at the, even some of the work you did to show um, some of the, the um, work that you did for the um, sort of inner city classroom buildings, art education buildings, how much of your work in school about really understanding space, perspective, capturing space is really still a part of your work now. So you, you sort of took the best of all of that and that still appears in the work here. That, um, I mean, one of the things clearly that could be descriptive of LA's experience is the sort of dispersal of space and sprawl and spreading and sort of lack of limits of the city, but you've managed to capture that in the work all the work, and I, I think that's all right. Well, I, those, um, many of, again, those fascinations, uh, in that sense, uh, I've never, uh, finding in those particular things that seem like um, there are certain ideas that are not really um, solvable, but that are some of the most important ideas uh, because yeah. you'll never probably resolve them completely, but they, they're the fuel that makes you keep wanting to investigate how you could do it differently in your next project. Um, and and I, I, I think that's true, you know, those, I see those, those connections, not always literally, sometimes afterwards, um, but it's still very much Maybe not in the <laughs> uh, I, I found it a very impressive lecture. Um, one thing that struck me at the end that I think is extremely powerful. If you can generalize and say that LA is a suburban city, uh, and the only thing How do you affect the city in order to just accumulate objects? And I think that's your point about the scale. Because I, this building, for example, that I know quite well because I've been around the Sion for over many years, is the size that the only way you can combat this monstrous kind of accumulation is by size. In other words, 
scale is something as an architect, I think we always talk about, but we always talk about it in very particular, um, particular ways. Um, uh, re related to the relationship with parts. Uh, but as a, as a tool, um, again, to almost start to take on the language of the civil engineers and the infrastructure engineers uh, and understand if there's a, if a, a way to start to um, uh, subsume that into our own um, language of, of architecture, history of architecture, uh, I think is one of the, the, the ways of challenging the, how architecture evolves in cities like Los Angeles, where it's in many ways unlikely. Um, you said it very My question, it might be a two-part question. Uh, the first question um, deals with these um, post-war public housing projects that are um, at the epic center of uh, architecture in the 1950s and 60s with Richard Meyer doing one of the first project, uh, housing projects that was uh, cold, brutalist in some aspect. Um, but it was detached from that, from the public uh, sphere now, because there was, uh, they were so deep, they were almost like alcoves. And so we see that still happening here. Like you have that same mimicking of uh, these huge housing projects in California as well. Um, so what does one do box and everyone has that little social space now? I didn't completely understand the second part of the question. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, Mike, think I, I, understand. I think I understood the first part of it, uh, but um, I can't tell if you like what we did or don't like what we did, <laughs> which well, it doesn't matter. You cannot like it. No, that's, just that's to piggyback on what you said, you said you received a lot of criticism. And I got that from, from your projects. I feel like you are very um, um, cutting it, like at the frontier. And that's why you get this criticism. Um, but I'm talking about like how that has been seen from just like a midship from an apartment giving like an aperture of uh, a garden to what it could be like after. I'm not sure. I'm still Our work or just in general? Well, in the work of the, of the architect. Because Bernardo Forpresia was here in uh, 2015, and he lectured about a project that he did. That was one of my criticisms about you is that your, some of your projects look familiar, like two other projects. And like another person who has lectured here was Bernardo Forpresia from Architectonica. Um, um, and he did that uh, Bronx. Uh, Museum that kind of looks like a little bit of your project, um, that housing project that looks like a like a 
like a cap, like a capsule cap, and it has like this nice screen in the, in the side. So what, what do you do about that? What do you say about that when your project looks like somebody else? Uh, Is that a more clear question? What do you do? <laughs> what do you say when somebody's project looks like that? Uh, doesn't keep me up at night. Um, I, hopefully, uh, as an architect, um, your, uh, your body of work is what defines your approach to, to architecture, as opposed to any one individual project. And uh, that body of work, if you feel to evolve in that way, um, I think you can feel confident about the work itself. Um, if there are certain themes that continue to, uh, that, that are similar between uh, different architects' work, especially generationally, uh, I also think that that um, isn't something that should surprise us, uh, partially because we share a history. We share uh, uh, a culture of architecture. Um, we certainly share knowledge of the other forms of architecture and other work that's going on out there. Uh, but it's that, that, that shared language through the history of architecture that we're all a part of uh, that I think is, is important. And um, in places where there are connections, similar ideas or maybe even similar forms, I think we can expect that that points to um, maybe some validity, um, a rightness to those forms uh, or, or to, to those ideas. Um, I, we can get into an argument about the, the personal language of architects and everything. It's not something that I think we'll have to unpack. So, um, wonderful lecture. Uh, big fan of your work. Uh, this is a, a bit of a softball, but one that is needed because we have a lot of our first year students that are in the back of the room. And we're sort of going through this process of teaching them different methods of practice and different ways that we can observe and sort of absorb architecture. And while I know that your presentation is talking about the social project you've completed recently, but could you very quickly explain to a lot of our students that are here sort of your means of process in working through those projects and if it's been the same consistently from your days at RISD all the way through now? Uh, none of the housing, pro even though I, I spoke specifically tonight about housing, uh, we don't have a separate, there's not a separate housing department, there's not a separate group that does that work. It's, it's completely integrated, it's part of, of all of the work. And I think um, the other types of projects we do influence the housing and the housing uh, influences those other projects all influence each other, especially around issues of, of, uh, of cities and urbanism. Um, each project starts in generally a fairly similar way. Um, it's a very, the office is really invested in, um, uh, in modeling the forms physically. So we do a lot of physical uh, three-dimensional modeling. There's a lot of digital modeling that goes on parallel to the process. But the primary tool for uh, the building still tends to be the physical model. Um, it's extremely important to me. It's extremely important to the way that we talk about the work um, in the office. So those ideas, uh, the initial idea uh, can come from many, many different places. Uh, it can come from an observation about the site. It can maybe come from a, an idea about the program. It can maybe come from historical idea um, uh, that uh, I'm interested in, somebody's interested in the office. It's not so much important where the initial idea comes from, it's just an, it's, it's more important that that idea is the kind of starting point, the launching point to go forward. I think John Cage, and I'm paraphrasing terribly here, but he said something like when confronted with the impossibility of starting, start any 
sort of believe that 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 something will will uh, allow you to uh, put a first mark down or a first form down, and then if you stick with it, inevitably you're reacting to that, and that back and forth conversation that happens in drawing, in the physical model, on the computer, however you're 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 producing the project, uh, begins to build and form. gets enough um, veracity, enough density to the, to the form and the idea that it can start to stand on its own. The critical point is that moment I find in the beginning of the project where that first idea is so fragile um, that I think as a designer sometimes it's important to protect that idea too much criticism, whether from yourself or from outside. It's important to be critical about things, but those first ideas are so nascent, they, they can't possibly sustain themselves um, that early. I mean, you have to push them along and give them some space until they start to get enough um, uh, protection. start to take on a different complexity. And then you, you can push them out and, and, and be in a more real conversation with your, your friends, your colleagues, the world around you. But it starts with that idea, it starts very physically, um, and then it continues to move, the models continue to be the primary, uh, designed to evolve over a period, models get bigger and bigger, and I would even say that when we get to construction, the full-scale mock-ups that we insist on for the project, are really an extension of that modeling process. Uh, we see them as the same, the same thing. Uh, when I make models, or when we make models in the office, I'm not concerned so much with the accuracy of the model representing everything exactly. Um, in fact, I'm more interested in how they start to infer scale as opposed to try to, we're not looking to try to make little mod model railroad buildings and their accuracy. How do you start to infer some of the scale, uh, textures, material complexities of, of the project? Can, can I ask a, just a tangential question to that? I mean, you're talking about the models in terms of the process in the office. How do the, are the models used with the client? And how does uh, that work? Well, the, we, uh, the, the clients see the models uh, very early on, which is sometimes ter terrifying think that's the building. Uh, they're not, um, but they are three-dimensional representations very often of the, the different quantities, all of the pieces. So, you know, it's not, um, it's not you know, something new to do diagrams two-dimensionally of uh, starting to lay out the different spaces and their, and their scale. That's a technique that architects use. We do that three-dimensionally. so that you can start to see not only the three-dimensional massing of the ideas that you're talking about, but even more importantly, the spaces that they start to create. I like the models as they move forward. I mean, this gets a little abstract, but I talked for a moment in the first project about simultaneity and these, the spatial problem of uh, being in many spaces at the same time, which I'm fascinated what I find very difficult on the screen is that even though you can move the, 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 the 3D, the solid models in, in the computer, the digital models, you can move them around quite quickly. Um, it's almost like uh, a dog chasing its tail. You can't quite catch the last thing that you saw. And so I can't ever hold the whole uh, net matrix of spaces and forms together at the same time, but in the physical model, you can. It's, it's almost like um, it, it allows you to have a more intact peripheral vision and control all of the spaces more readily, at least for me. So um, that becomes 
too, and I've, I've written about this a little bit, is, and it relates to the models again. Um, the models that are really tough for me, we, if you were to come to the office, it's an office that's kind of littered with models. And there are models of projects that have been built and models of projects that haven't been built. And the models of projects that have not been built are the ones that I really struggle with because I feel like those models uh, have the continual, the perpetual burden of standing in for what it, it, it was meant to be for the building. They never get released from their responsibility to be, they are the final form. But the models of projects that got built, even if they were study models, I feel like they got released from that burden, that responsibility, and they can become something else. They don't have to stand in for that, that other idea. Um, and those very often uh, lead to, they're, they're open to different interpretations and even misinterpretations. Um, and I find them very valuable to start to try to imagine how you could launch off from an idea about a form or a space uh, that um, uh, relates to your work, but um, but that you can transform somehow. Yeah, I sort of start um, the, the next step from from that is uh, that first approach I was uh, going back to the design of the street or the the, the, the aesthetic of the project and then going back and then we'll take one step. We're going to stop here because it's getting late, but if you are interested, the, this conversation can continue tomorrow. <laughs> okay, one more, one more. In a way, there's two questions, or maybe observation or question there. One, how, how do we respond to the particulars of the community that the buildings are in? And, and um, uh, that happens in a number of different ways. Very often, there are a series of very public conversations um, with that community. Uh, and increasingly, those are, those are very much a part of the, the process of any building in, a, in any kind of jurisdiction, municipality, city, neighborhood. Um, there's an expectation that that's really a part of that process. In many cases, they're um, extensive and they're continuous. It's important to not go once, listen to people, and never come back and continue that conversation. So they are uh, generally, the community is, very, is generally very much a part of um, the ongoing design process. Can see where you have heard them and where you haven't heard them, or how you have heard them and maybe uh, for whatever set of because of whatever set of um, of uh, pragmatic issues that have come up, you've had to reinterpret that some. But it's important to have that uh, as a real part of the dialogue. For instance, we a project I didn't show tonight called the Sixth Street Bridge, which is a large viaduct and bridge that connects across the river about a mile long, replacing a historic and much beloved bridge uh, that had huge connections and memories for the communities on both sides of 
river had to be torn down for um, uh, earthquake reasons. But the new bridge uh, is fraught in many ways from the beginning, trying to replace or live within the memories of, of those different communities. Um, that has been from day one, before we even started to design the bridge, uh, there have been an ongoing series of meetings um, uh, to, to set up a dialogue. And it doesn't happen instantaneously. In fact, there's, there's a lot of apprehension and um, sometimes animosity and um, wariness in, in many of those conversations. And the only way that you can uh, move forward, I think, is Consistent about continuing to move that conversation forward. Uh, be honest about your disagreements, um, and, uh, and and to try to find ways to uh, uh, make sense of those disagreements on on both sides. In terms of of the buildings, I, our buildings, I know for a fact, uh, people have very different. people who fall in love with our buildings on day one. There are people who will never fall in love with our buildings, no matter how long um, they're around them. And, that, and there are people who are in between. Um, uh, I think that's one of the realities of, of architecture. It's a public art. It's a public, it lives in the public space. And uh, I've seen just as many buildings try to that everybody loved from day one, and sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. Um, I, I, I think that's one of the, the challenges and realities of architecture. Um, we make things, if, if you're, if you're, um, if you're truthful about uh, the process and believe in what you do and are open about what you do and are open about the dialogue Criticized for that, um, I, I think that's part of it, and probably not a bad part of it. Um, the architecture that shies away from being a part of the conversation, sometimes even being an instigator of the conversation, in my mind is is stepping back from some of the responsibility architecture has. Um, cities only continue to thrive. a future because we're willing to have a debate about what that future is. And buildings, for better or worse, are very often the terms around which we have those debates and those conversations. And that means not everybody's going to agree. I think that's OK. Thank you very much. Like I said, the conversation continues tomorrow with a presentation titled Work Life Affordability and Accessibility for Artists at the Bakehouse uh, Complex tomorrow at 6.30. So please join us there if you're interested. <laughs>